Tonight we'll be in the have the 28th lesson in Genesis as we're progressing right along through it. And we'll cover some very important uh, principles of thought here tonight. Remember, we're becoming acquainted with, with God Amen. in this, and that's the thing we really want to see. We're also seeing that a context is being prepared for the coming Christ. That's another thing to see. That they, So this is more than just like God reacting to certain circumstances. He, he does, and that you learn about God's nature. We're going to learn something very fundamental about God's nature tonight. I, I think the Lord has showed me a, a way to say it that is at least it's refreshed to me. And then we're seeing what's necessary to exist when Christ came. There had to be a certain kind of a setting. So our text is Genesis 28, 16 through 33, which is the end of the chapter. Remember, three men have visited Abram, Abraham, it was Abraham, and uh, announced that Sarah was going to have a son about that, about the time, springtime next year. Sarah had laughed within herself. Nobody heard her. Not a person in the world that would say she really laughed, but she, but she did God's assessment. She denied that she had laughed. Which probably, she probably meant, and charitably, that she hadn't laughed out loud. And then the last word was that the angel said, "No, you did laugh." Well, our text picks up from there. And the men rose up from thence and looked toward Sodom. And Abraham went with them to bring them on the way. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do, seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great nation and a mighty nation, a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I know him, that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord and do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken of him. Oh, that's, a, that's quite an insight, isn't it? And the Lord said, Because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the cry of it which has come unto me, and if not, I will know. And the men turned their faces from thence and went towards Sodom, but Abraham stood yet before the Lord. And Abraham drew near and said, Wilt thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Peradventure there be fifty righteous within the city, will thou also destroy and not spare the place for the fifty righteous that are therein? That be far from thee to do after this manner, to slay the righteous with the wicked, and that the righteous should be as the wicked, that be far from thee. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? And the Lord said, If I find in Sodom fifty righteous within the city, then I will spare all the place for their sakes. And Abraham answered and said, Behold now, I have taken upon me to speak unto the Lord, which am but dust and ashes. Peradventure there shall lack five of the fifty righteous. Wilt thou destroy all the city for lack of five? He said, If I find there forty and five, I will not destroy it. He spake unto him yet again and said, Peradventure there be forty found there. And he said, I will not do it for forty's sake. He said unto him, O let not the Lord be angry, 
and I will speak. Peradventure there shall 30 be found there. He said, I'll not do it if I find 30 there. He said, Behold, now I have taken upon me to speak to the Lord. Peradventure there shall be 20 found there. He said, I'll not destroy it for 20's sake. He said, Oh, let not the Lord be angry, and I'll speak yet but this once. Peradventure 10 shall be found there. He said, I will not destroy it for 10's sake. And the Lord went his way as soon as he had left communing with Abraham, and Abraham returned unto his place. That is a very profound text. <coughs> I want to observe that divine, the divine contacts God had with men for the first 2,000 years of human history, and that's where we're at now. This Abraham is about, about 2,000 years, give or take, some, but, but about 2,000 years. How much contact did God have with people over those, and to kind of heighten how long 2,000 years is, it's been 2,000 years since Jesus was here. To kind of give you an idea how long. <laughs> well, he had contact the first year with Adam and Eve. He spoke to them. Their input was very limited. Then he's about the somewhere after the between year two and two thir and year thirty, we don't have any idea when, but he spoke to Cain. And that wasn't a favorable communication. Now another five hundred and fifty some years pass, and Enoch walked with God for three hundred years. That's that's five hundred and Fifty-seven years after the last communication, then another uh, roughly thousand years passed. God talked to Noah when he was four hundred and eighty years old, and then another three hundred three fifty years passed, and he talked to Abraham when at the age of seventy to seventy-four, somewhere in there. <laughs> Now, that's not a lot of communication for a God that loves the human race. I've never really heard anyone deal with this. This is telling us something. This is telling us what sin did, see? Yeah. Amen. Tell us what sin did. Now, consider against this, consider that the that the salvation of God is purposed down to the finest detail before the world is ever made. Now that, keep, keep that in mind. The birth of Jesus is going forth, the prophecy was from old, from everlasting. So God dealing with humanity with all this in mind, but he's not divulging anything of it for the first 2,000 years. He, has, he doesn't say anything about this thing that he purposed before the world was. So that's telling us something. That's, he had the culture men to, to even talk to him. Amen. And Jesus said, Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. So keep that in mind. God had prepared a kingdom for his people before he made the world. Yeah. He prepared it, but he, he didn't uh, say anything about it to anybody up to this time we're, we're dealing with here. And his works are known to him from from the beginning of the world. So what God was going to do, he he didn't adjust his plans or change his plans or adapt his plans, but he didn't he didn't divulge them any. He had a mystery that's kept secret since the world began. See, you got to keep this in mind now, see, because men want to tell what they know right off the bat. They want to, they want to tell, they says God didn't do this. And there's a wisdom that was ordained that related to redeeming men. A wisdom was ordained before the world unto our glory. And we were chosen before the foundation yeah. of the world. And from the beginning of the world, there's a mission been hidden in God. He, 
it wasn't that he didn't want to divulge it, because you know as the time progressed, he had this, he wanted to divulge it, but something inhibited him from, de, from revealing it. Now, this is, a, this is very important to know, because if a person is ignorant of God, you, you stop the well of salvation and the well of revelation. So I'm proving to you this is the case. There was an eternal purpose. He purposed before the world began. Purpose and grace was given to us in Christ Jesus before the world began. Eternal life was promised before the world began. The Lamb was ordained before the world began. But the foundation of the world. Names are written in the Lamb's book of life from the foundation of the world. So it's difficult to conceive of anything being more made more plain than this, that the purpose encapsulated in redemption is an eternal purpose. It has never been adjusted or modified or adapted. It's precisely the same as it was before he ever created the world. Amen. And yet, God kept a secret and nobody could discover it. There were a lot of smart people that lived up up. To Abraham. In fact, the world's smartest people lived back then. Mm -hmm. So I tell you the truth. If you know, if you know your history and you know who discovered medicine, who discovered mathematics, and who started writing, all the brains of the human race existed back then, and everybody else has built on what they discovered back then. Uh -huh. Now, if you don't believe that, you just you just have to be a good historian, study your history, and. Everybody, the home schools tell your children about this. Mm -hmm. That all people done, they discovered, they just learned to put together what was assembled back, mm -hmm. way back there. So it's pretty consistent. I mean, people were, commit, were performing brain surgery before Abraham. Did you know that? Mm -hmm. Yes. Actually, it's gone downhill instead of, you know. That's right. They, instead of really uh, adding to it, you just kind of. Made, made it more, uh, just kind of made it uh, de de degenerated instead That's of right. doing they, anything else. They tell us, the historians tell us that an Egyptian child at 10 years of age was well acquainted with calculus and trigonometry. This was a common knowledge among Egyptian children at 10 years old. But it is not common knowledge today. In fact, a full-grown adult will tell to you, will tell you, if they study trigonometry and higher math, that it's hard to comprehend. In other words, the human aptitude has gone down. That's why people are indulging so much in sin. See, but people are teaching other people that it's gone up. We'll let the government educate your children because they see that this is all an erroneous view. Now, some might say, well, but uh, God shows mercy to sinners, doesn't he? He did back then, yes, but it only because of Christ. If Christ wasn't in the picture, nobody would have got mercy. Amen. This is the point I wish to make here. That's why it's important to see that God's salvation was planned before the per yes. world. So anyone that got mercy mm -hmm. up until Jesus got it because of the coming Christ. That's right. why uh -huh. they got it. Now, we, now this is taught in Scripture, so we shouldn't bog at this. Yeah. Let it be clear, as Ephesians 4.32 says, God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. Or God has given you both to believe on Christ and to suffer for him in the behalf of Christ. See, it's <laughs> so it can't be that humanity improved after the flood because God said, made the same assessment of humanity after the flood that it made before the flood. The imagination of the man's heart is evil from his youth. That was after the flood. That was the assessment before the flood. So the flood didn't change anybody. However, a purpose was developed before the foundation of the world that centered in the coming of Christ. That's why we're reading of God working with people, revealing to people, using people to bless. That's, it's not because of them, it's because of his Christ. Is why. 
Now this has great relevance to our text. Because commencing with Abraham, God begins to develop his eternal purpose, which was kept secret, totally secret up to that time. He didn't tell anybody he was going to bless anybody. You read about God's blessing. He blessed Adam and Eve. Said, "Be fruitful and multiply." He blessed Noah. Be fruitful and multiply. Now see this thing about a promised blessing up in the future. He didn't divulge that to anybody. Even Enoch walked with God, but he didn't know about this. He knew about the flood and about judgment. As he knew about that. That's why this is relevant to this text. Begin commencing with Abraham. God now begins to crack open this eternal purpose. Let you see some pictures of it. And the first depiction he gives is all families of the earth are going to be blessed. That is my target. What I'm going to do, I'm going to bless all families. Nobody had the slightest idea of this until Abraham. Maybe common for you to think about God blessing people, but it was not common in the human race to think about God blessing people. And the great epochs of human history up to Abraham were not about blessing. They were about judgment and cursing. Whether you're talking about Adam and Eve or Cain or the flood or the Sinai incident, whatever you're talking about, it wasn't talking about God's mercy until we come to Abraham. And he begins to open up this great truth about Abraham's seed. Now why is there such a difference in the amount of revelation on the subject of Messiah in our time. When even in the time of the prophets, there was a conservative number of revelations about the coming Christ. The difference in the amount of revelation is owing to the removal of sin. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's right. It's certainly not because men became better or, or men are more capable of understanding. It was because Jesus did take away sin. And when he did... Cleared the air, so to speak, for God to speak more about this matter. Once sin is put away by the sacrifice of Christ, the sins of the world are taken away. God saw the travail of his soul and was satisfied. Now he can begin. Even then he couldn't just like divulge the whole thing. But he can begin to teach people to look for a blessing. Look Look for a blessing. Look for the intervention of God in this. Look for somebody that come that will rectify this situation as sin is caused. Now you, it's good to ponder like what, what could men know about God up to Abraham? What kind of understanding did they have? Well, they knew God was a creator. They knew the devil's defeat was cast in stone. They knew that God finds out sin. If you sin, God finds out. Adam and Eve, Cain, you know, the world. Of... Now, some people still don't know that in our day. So if people sin, God will find it out. And he'll, he'll, he'll do something to let you know he knows about that. And we knew there were sacrifices God receives, and there were sacrifices God doesn't receive. We learned that from Cain and Abel early on. And that God requires men to do certain things. God is a demanding God. Build an ark. Leave your father's house. God makes demands. He's got a right to. And God saves people because of somebody else. He saved Noah's family and the animals because of Noah. He's going to save Lot because of Abraham. We learn that God monitors in response to the works of men. These are things God revealed up to the time. A lot of these things aren't known in our time. They were made known way back there. God monitors in response to the works of men. He saw the men down there in Sinai were building the city and the tower city. He responded to it. God's a destroyer. He destroyed the whole world. God calls people, exercising an initiative toward them. He instigates, he initiates contact with humanity and tells them to do something. This, this is, they knew, well, God does this, he did it with Abraham. God calls people to move from one place to another. And God is an enabler. He enabled Abraham to 
begat children. He enabled Sarah to conceive. He's, he's an, ab an enabler. And God visits those he calls, informing them what to do. Noah was the first example, Abraham the second example. And God is, uh, God is almighty. There isn't anything he can't do. Which men can't, there's, men can't think this big. This is too big a thought for men. You've got to have faith to, to even accept this. Otherwise, it's just like talk. That's all it is. Because in human, in human understanding, there isn't anybody that, that is totally unlimited. But God is. See, and that's, a, that's not in men's mind cannot think of somebody like this. They can think of someone as very strong, very powerful, but they can't think all powerful. They can't, can't, that's got to be revealed to people. And God requires for men to walk before him in a perfect manner. It was revealed to Abraham, walk before me and be thou perfect. We learn God's a protector. These are things people knew about God at the time of Abraham. He's a protector. I am the shield. He's a rewarder. What God gives, he expects people to examine and receive. We learn that God gives an inheritance to people. God can work in a manner transcendent to human nature. So if your thinking is confined to your aptitude, you don't need to pray or ask God to do anything because God doesn't operate with those kind of limitations. We learn that God makes promises. He did to Noah, did to Abraham. God visits in human forms. We, we, we learn that. And that God uh, makes promises. Those are things that you could know about God at the time of Abraham. See, not everybody knew this about God. But those who had faith, which were very few, like we're talking about Enoch, Noah, Abraham, you know, and Enoch, Noah, and Abraham, and it. Not many, but those who did, they picked up on this that happened over a span of 2,000 years. See, this wasn't all close, this was like a class that you took and all these things were developed. This was developed not by word, but by action, yeah. over thousands of years, or centuries of time. Now, how many lessons would you learn if you had to go over centuries of time? Of course, men couldn't give you a degree for that, could they? No. They concentrated everything in like a three, four year, five year period of time. Mm -hmm. This wasn't like that. This wasn't concentrated. This is spread over, so you had to be alert, you had to be acquainted with the past, you had to know about believers in the past, you had to know what God did in the past, or you wouldn't have known anything about God. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's how there's a lot to learn about this. So now, <clears throat> God has appeared in three, form of three men, to Abraham, he's entertained them, and now, after the communication has passed, they've told Abraham what he needs to be told. They've made the promises need to be made, no further need to stay. They don't say, now is there anything else you need, Abraham? Yeah. Didn't say this, did they? I, I, I didn't read it. No. Anything, uh, have any difficulty in the family? Abraham? No, the sole purpose is bring Abraham to know what he's doing, what God's doing. Right. Amen. So they stop over. Did what they were, did their business, moved on. Now, heavenly involvements with men always center in God's will. If you try and make your involvement with God to center in your need, we're not going to tell you God's not interested in you. We're not, we're not going to say that. We're going to say this is in the wrong direction. Before God has any interest at all in your need, you've got to have a prevailing interest in what he's doing. Amen. And when you do, then it'll shape your idea about need, That's right. Amen. and God will be more inclined Amen. towards you. It's a valuable lesson to learn. God is never presented as a chum or a buddy. Yes. Now, if you view him that way, which this is, this is being taught in our day, this is being taught by novices, uh, but this is a mis misset comprehension. When God is unknown, 
there's a tendency of men to oversimplify their view of man's associations with God. So they will talk about God differently. If they don't know him, they, they just have a different idea about him. Now, to our text, when the heavenly messengers completed their mission, they just left. That was, it. It was the end of it. It didn't surprise Abraham. They looked towards Sodom. That was their next assignment. We learn later that these messengers were actually sent to remove Lot from Sodom and to destroy it. See, later it tells you about these went on. We see from the account they were faithful stewards. Finish this assignment, move on to the next. There's what scriptures say about angels. Bless the Lord, ye his angels, that excel in strength, that do his commandments, hearkening to the voice of his words. So there was no reason for them to even be here, except they'd been sent on a mission. Having completed it, they moved forward. You ought to learn from them. You ought to learn from angels. Pick up on what the Lord wants you to do. Do it and look for the next assignment. Now this is an example of a certain mindset that exists among believers. Believers are admonished in their race to look unto Jesus, see? Their focus has got to be, like these men focused on Sodom. They didn't, they didn't look towards some other city, Ur of the Chaldees. They didn't, they didn't look there. They didn't look toward Egypt, Alexandria, Egypt, some place in Greece. They looked to Sodom. That's where their next assignment was. Scripture says that we are to look, grace teaches us to look for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. See, think of this passage, you think of looking. They look. Uh -huh. yeah. We look for a new heavens and a new earth, and mm -hmm. those who live by faith look for a city as builder makers of God. They look, mm -hmm. they focus. Yeah. See, one of the great concerns of our time is the absence of heavenly mindedness. Mm -hmm. It's a very uh, disconcerting thing to me. I'm very concerned about this. So much so sometimes it's difficult to know how to respond to it. But it's out of order. Yeah. For anyone who claims to be of God, mm -hmm. to not be heavenly minded, not be looking the right direction, mm -hmm. this is bad. Well, they looked toward Sodom, and Abraham, Abraham went with them mm -hmm. to bring them on their way. See, his hospitality didn't end at the tent there. He went along with them. An additional act of hospitality. Plus, it indicates he must have been enjoying this uh, communion with these three, what appeared to be three men. This must have been an enjoyable experience. He, wouldn't, he didn't say, well, we're glad they're gone. Aren't you, Sarah? Boy, we're glad they're gone. What? Don't have to worry now about what you're thinking. <laughs> oh, this is how some people think. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We get to go home now, and we won't have to be convicted anymore. We can get down to doing what we really enjoy. That's not how Abraham thought. He went with them to bring them on their way. He's not the first person, of course, that uh, did something like that. There's some examples of this. In other words, what I'm saying here is when you enjoy the fellowship of someone, you're not anxious to separate. Mm -hmm. right. Now, you remember when Paul called the elders of Ephesus to Miletus? They had to take a boat trip to get there. Mm -hmm. And he communicated with them. He warned them about coming apostasy. And then he had to leave, and there's what it says, sorry and most of all for the words he spake that they should see his face no more. And they accompanied him unto the ship. See, that's, safe. that's exactly what Abraham did. When he stopped at Tyre en route to Jerusalem, Paul tarried several days with the disciples he found there. And at the conclusion of that, it says, when he had accomplished those days, we departed and went our way, and they all brought us on our way with wives and children till we were out of the city, and we kneeled down on the shore and prayed. Oh, that's a, that's a blessed thing to read about something like that. Amen. Amen. I haven't met a lot of people like that in my lifetime, but I've met some, and I'm very thankful that I have. Some of you are among that number. 
So the acts of Abraham was more than culture or politeness. He revealed how much he appreciated this, this word yeah. came from God. See, if you live a self-centered life, you don't do things like this. All right, now the, uh, the Lord stays behind and two angels move ahead. The Lord means it like the angel of the Lord. He stays behind. The other two go ahead. The Lord said, he's talking to the other angels. The Lord said, shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do? Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him, for I know him, that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken of. <laughs> now what we what these angels were going to do was cast in stone. There was no, they'd been sent to destroy the city. That is what they were going to do. But you pick up here on God has this desire to share this. Yes, amen. Now he'd shared it with the angels. They'd, they'd got in on it. But he, uh, he wants to share it with Abraham too. As I mentioned, this is probably the angel of the Lord I give you some references to refer to the angel of the Lord, the angel of his presence. God referred to him as my angel. He's referred to as his angel. So this is a special angel that wasn't in the same category as these other yeah. two angels. I don't know if it's like an archangel. I have no idea about that, but it's a special angel. Mm -hmm. And now he wants to communicate. I don't want to keep this back from Abram. Now, early on in the 13th chapter, verse 13, God prepared us for this event. Mm -hmm. Back in Genesis 13, 13, it said, The men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. Now, the time of our text is at least 13 years later. That observation was made shortly before Ishmael was born. Ishmael, we're told, is 13 at, the time, at this time here. So at least 13 years had passed since that assessment was made which means God had endured yeah, yeah. Sodom for at least that long further Lot is described by God as that righteous man so God had a plant mm -hmm. there in Sodom right. to acquaint them with the ways of the Lord to call them to repentance Now, as we're going to see, as difficult as it is for some people to receive, there are some environments that can't be changed. Some bodies of people that can't be turned around. Some individuals that can't be brought to repentance. Don't try and figure out who these are. That's not your business to do this. I'm just telling you that there are people like that. Egypt is a case in point. They were exposed to Joseph. They were exposed for 430 years to the Israelites that were God-centered people. Yeah, that's right. See, so they had almost a half a millennium mm -hmm. to shape up. Mm -hmm. And they didn't. Said they isolated them off. Didn't pay any attention, any attention to them. There was also uh, Jerusalem, who had the ministry of John the Baptist, in an extended over three year ministry of the Lord Jesus the Messiah himself and it didn't didn't change them at all they even killed the prince of life so I'm showing you there's some people that can't be changed and it's possible for you to waste a lot of time on them yeah, that's right. you can't draw back until you have some sound reason for thinking that they're in this category understand now the divine nature is to confirm that we learn something about God. That God observes what's going on and he's looking for somebody he can trust. Amen. All right, now let's, let's scriptures teach this. Let's take just sight of three verses here. 
The eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of those, them whose heart is perfect toward him. So here's, this is, this is how God is. So nobody else may see you. God will. Here's Isaiah 57, 15. For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble, to revive the heart of the contrite one. See, this is God telling people. But he didn't tell them in Abraham's days. He lived it out in a person. Isaiah 66, 2. To this man will I look, even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit and trembleth at my word. So God, who is great and unsearchable and who cannot be comprehended by men, <laughs> has revealed that he, certain people he's inclined to. Yeah. Well, there is no reason, so far as we know, why you couldn't be a person like that. Yeah. Amen. We know things like this about God. We should make it our aim to fall into that category. The world, they'll object to it. And the church will even object to it. You'll, be, you'll become a strange person when you do it, but hey, it's, this is worth it. To have the eyes of the Lord fastened on you is worth it. So in Abraham, God found a man that he could divulge these things to. Abraham will surely become a great nation because he's ordained it, see. This wasn't Abraham's idea. This was God's. He's become a great nation. All the nations of the earth will be blessed. So we, we, we want to keep this man informed. Being as this man's going to become a great nation, we got to, the head of the nation, he's got to be an informed person. He and his seed are going to become the custodians of the truth. So we've got to, uh, we've got to divulge to him what we're doing. See, all this postulates the faithfulness of Abraham to make known what God reveals to him. Because he's going to live and die and not see this thing come to pass. Mm -hmm. She's got to leave it to the next generation, and that generation has to leave it to the next generation. Yeah. You couldn't, could you plan something like this? And if you did have a desire, how would you exactly carry it out? Right. Sometimes we can't get one, like one generation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we can't. <laughs> We can't communicate effectively to the next generation, let alone to many generations. But Abraham will do this. And you consider that uh, no, no major Christian movement has gone to the second generation. They've all fizzled out after the first generation. The second, they really got weak, and the third, the person are gone. The Gentile church has waffled through the centuries. It's not been faithful. It's, it's not done what Abraham. Gentile church has utterly failed. It hasn't done this at all. The foundation has been eroded and passed away. And today, some people don't even know what they are. You know, here's Abraham. He's going to be faithful. Pass it down. This is because the people aren't trustworthy. They aren't genuine. Not living by faith. Did you know that many Christian parents teach their children more about hygiene than they do about Jesus? Yeah. Who doesn't know this is the truth? Yeah. I'm talking about Christian people. Yeah. Not with Abraham. Abraham passed it down. He said, now they will keep the way of the Lord. Yeah. Oh, that's some statement. They'll keep the way of the Lord. <coughs> that's a manner of life. way of the Lord is a manner of life, a way of living. They'll keep it. Isaiah called it the way of holiness. It is true that those who walk with God live in a certain way. Amen. They live in a certain manner. This can be identified. You can tell the difference between people living for God and people that aren't. It's noticeable. You don't think it is? It is. But today, who says they're Christians and who says they're not, it's almost impossible to tell the difference between the two. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes the people who aren't Christians, they actually have a better outward appearance than the people that are calling themselves Christians. Yeah. See, so they, but this is not, this didn't come from Abraham's seed. Amen. This is another kind of seed. 
we're talking about. They'll keep the way of the Lord. And they'll do justice and judgment. They'll think of all the people in the human race who haven't done justice and judgment. <laughs> they'll do justice and judgment. This is a, the apostolic way of saying this, is that they'll do things that are acceptable to God and approved of men. Romans 14, 18. That is that there is a certain level of living that even the world knows is right. Where people don't steal from other people and they don't lie about other people. And even the world recognizes it's true. That's why Paul said, I, we commend ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. You, you see, we should, any Christian should be able to say to any sinner, say, just, just look at me and see if you can find anything flawed in me. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So nobody can say that. Well, now that's just not true. Yes, people need to quit saying that. Yes. We all have our faults, yeah, but they are internal, they're not outward. That's right. yeah. You're expected to be blameless. You're expected that your outward conduct cannot be flawed. Mm -hmm. You are expected to keep it that way, even though you may have fierce struggles inside, yeah. and you may have to subdue thoughts and all this sort of thing. Your outward manner of life has got to be spotless. Yeah. Amen. Well, John the Baptist wouldn't even baptize you if it wasn't. If you're a drunkard, you had to quit being a drunkard before you were baptized. Mm -hmm. You're a drug addict, you got to quit that before. Mm -hmm. So how's that possible? Well, God stands behind the effort if it's, right. if it's genuine repentance. That's right. They do justice and judgment. Mm -hmm. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. As 2 Corinthians 8.21 says. Now there's an example of some observation, an observation made by some of the enemies of Israel relatively early in history when Ben-Hadad, who was a Syrian king, come against Israel and to make a long story short, he was soundly defeated and had to go back to his own country. And in humiliation, his advisors came to him and they made an observation about the Israeli kings. Here is the account. It's found in 1 Kings 20, 31. Behold, we have heard that the kings of the house of Israel are merciful kings. Let us, I pray thee, put sackcloth on our loins and ropes upon our heads and go down to the king of Israel. Peradventure, he will save thy life. The kings of Israel were merciful kings? They shall do justice and judgment. <laughs> this is years after Abraham, but this is passed down. They were not ruthless. Uh -huh. Oh, they did have some kings that were that way, but uh -huh. God let you know they were they did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. Uh -huh. But there was a generation all along who wouldn't do this. They did justice uh -huh. <coughs> and mercy. That's an example of conduct being tempered by the knowledge of God. Now, I know that he'll command his children, they'll do justice and judgment, keep the way of the Lord, that, uh -huh. in order that, uh -huh. the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he has promised. Uh -huh. All right, now, whatever a person may think about mercy and grace and divine kindness, God does not bestow benefits on those who live in contradiction to his person. Amen. Now, whatever a person may think about this, you really got to see this. This is the way God is. We're seeing how God is. There's a lot of things I know said about being unworthy. We're not worthy and so blah, blah, blah. But there's some things said about being worthy in the Bible. There's some things said about it. And they had better be taken seriously. Speaking of the destruction of Jerusalem. They that shall be accounted worthy to obtain that world and the resurrection from the dead. Neither marry nor given in marriage. See the... Some worthy. You gotta be worthy of that world. Mm -hmm. This speak, this text speaks of the destruction of Jerusalem. Watch therefore and pray always that ye may be counted worthy to escape all those things that shall come to pass. All right. Now, if if there's some kind of judgment around the corner, and it could very 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 well may be that this is the case. Mm -hmm. Pray that you may be counted worthy mm -hmm. to escape it. Ephesians 4.1, 1, 
walk worthy of the vocation or with your call. Colossians 1.10, walk worthy of the Lord. 1 Thessalonians 2.12, walk worthy of God. 2 Thessalonians 1.5, he may count you worthy of the kingdom. 2 Thessalonians 1.11, that God will count you worthy of this calling. 1 Timothy 5.17, the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor. Thou shalt not, 1 Timothy 5.15, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out of the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. Jesus to the church of Sardis, they, Thou hast a few names even in Sardis which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. See, so this, there's enough said about worthy in the Bible that we ought to be careful about how we speak about it. It's to be acknowledged now that God's made us meet or qualified or in a sense made us worthy. We, we know that, but that had better be the case. What God, what God makes you, if it's not lived out, you can't prove God did it. That's right. Amen. If God made you worthy and then you live in an unworthy manner, don't be counted on the fact that God made you worthy. Something hasn't happened if you're walking unworthy. When God's grace is received, a moral chain, a spiritual change takes place. A very real thing. This is the thing that makes us peculiar to yes. others. Right. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Now this principle, see, is lived out in Abraham. He will command his children in his house after him. Why? He, see, he has this faith. He's really got something, so he'll really do something. That's right. Now, God's grace comes to us, this little chart I provided, through Christ. That makes it legitimate. Mm -hmm. Through Christ. When grace finds you, so to speak, you're dead in trespasses and sins, and you're unclean, and you're an enemy of God, and alienated from God, and guilty. But grace does a work, as you buy grace through faith, so your, your faith accesses the grace, and a transformation takes place. So you're not dead, now you're alive. You're not unclean, now you're washed. You're not alien, an enemy, now you're reconciled. You're not alienated, now you're accepted. You're not guilty, now you're justified. Salvation made you worthy. And once worthy, there's a certain conduct that's expected. If it doesn't happen, the person has quenched the spirit. He's trodden underfoot the Son of God and counted the blood of the covenant an unholy thing. Mm -hmm. That's the only way this can happen. Yeah. God's salvation is great. Now I must say something in all of this about the role of Jesus in all of this involvement with men. The nature of God to confer benefits on the unworthy and transgressor is what necessitates Christ. Mm -hmm. God will not, I want to be emphatic of this, God will not confer benefits on sinners and transgressors. Mm -hmm. yeah. That circumstance has got to change. Yes. It can't change by just telling the people what to do. Mm -hmm. There has to be some kind of an intervening personality yeah. that will take the responsibility for the infractions mm -hmm do something that has to be done and enable God to make this person different. Mm -hmm. And if that doesn't happen, mm -hmm. there'll be no change. Mm -hmm. Christ is the means provided to address sin mm -hmm. and to confer righteousness, both of them. We become, you see, it's, it's not only necessary for your transgressions to be eliminated, you've got to become the righteousness of God. Amen. For that to happen, Jesus is, is essential. Amen. <coughs> now what does that have to do with Abraham? Because Abraham is being blessed in anticipation of Christ. We know this is the case because the promises were made to Abraham and his seed, which seed is Christ. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the Nothing was promised to Abraham that was not encapsulated in Christ. With him it was Christ coming in the with us as Christ has come. Oh, it's a great truth to see. Now the Lord says, 
Because the cry of Sodom is great, and because their sin is very grievous, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the cry of it, which has come to me. If not, I will know. And the men turned their faces from thence and went to Sodom, but Abraham stood yet before the Lord. And we're going to find just, just two of them went on. Now, why does God talk this way? Does it mean he really didn't know? Well, no, but here, here's the fact that men do not have the ability to comprehend a God that knows what's in a person. This is not a human experience. There's no, there's only, men only speak about this philosophically. They, they can't comprehend a God that knows what the situation is. This is a foreign thought to men. So God speaks in this manner to kind of bring down the concepts so we can understand it because we couldn't understand it. We, we just philosophize about it and men tend to do it anyway. Talk about God's prescience or foreknowledge. He sees ahead of time what's going to happen. See, they can't comprehend that God. No, God never. There is never a time when God doesn't know. Yes, amen. Amen. Never. Amen. So I'm going to go down. He says. <clears throat> In other words, what he's saying is, I'm going to do something about this now. <clears throat> now I've endured this for who knows how long. We you know. It's been it's been an iniquitous situation for at least 13 years. It probably was a lot longer than that, but. When he says, I'll go down, what he's saying is, I'm now going to address this situation. <coughs> now, the scriptural record is to the point on this, that the ways of man are open to the eyes of the Lord. And God has a certain response when he sees sin. Now, we know it's the case when Adam and Eve sinned, expelled from the garden. God had a response to it. When Cain was judged by God, he was cursed. God responded. I've got to pick up now what I'm, what I'm going to say here. In Noah's day, God saw the earth was filled with violence, and he responded to it. And it was it, what, none of these cases, it was, none of it was with mercy. None of it was, unless the mercy would be that he didn't just utterly annihilate them. The reaction to the prideful determination of the people of Shinar, there's no when he saw it, he reacted to it, dispersed them. Now we have the fifth revelation of the response of God to growing iniquity. Sodom and Gomorrah. In the first revelation, he responded to disobedience, Adam and Eve. In the second, it was to the aggression of man against man, Cain. To the third, it was the pervasiveness of violence, the world of, of Noah's day. To the fourth, it was that the, it may, could have been the entire human race was caught up in pride in and of themselves. Now, in this fifth, two specific cities are mentioned, and the sin is of a moral nature, one that contradicted even the laws of nature. Once again, it's a group of people that are perceived and judged. The third time God has dealt with a group of people, you had the flood, Shinar, and now. You could add to it other times he dealt with a group of people. He judged Egypt. He judged the Amorites, Hittites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hivites, Jebusites, the Amorites, Nineveh, Tyre, Sidon, Israel, Babylon, the Edomites, Jerusalem, and you could go on groups of people, groups. Some people don't think this is so. They only think of personal it's me and God, and that's all. No, there's groups. Yes, Amen. There's groups. It's an aspect of divine nature that is rarely proclaimed in our day. Yet 2,800 years ago, mm -hmm. God inspired the psalmist to write, The wicked shall be turned into hell, and all the nations that forget God. Yes. Amen. Don't think that this won't happen. Mm -hmm. All sin is not the same. And the glibs say, well, sin, sin. That's just too simplistic. It's unworthy of being uttered. Yeah. Some people say murder is no worse than overeating. I've actually heard that. Yeah. The text confronts us with the word of the Lord himself. Their sin was very grievous. Some other versions say very grave, very evil, very serious. 
exceeding grievous, utterly grave, blatant, utterly evil, great, exceedingly, exceedingly heavy, and immense. So, so, so all sin can't be the same because here's a sin that whoa, it's very big, very large, very large. Now here's how sin is. Sin as it grows gets larger. It finally hits up. It goes past the line of divine tolerance. Mm -hmm. There comes a point God will just not put up with it anymore. Mm -hmm. That's what we're what we're seeing here. When he when that time comes, judgment. Uh -huh. yeah. There are enough examples of this in Scripture. Nobody should have to have a a lot of detailed tutelage on this. There's enough examples in Scripture about this. And God said, to Israel, you provoke me these ten times. That's it. You're not getting in. <coughs> See? Come to a point where God is uh, not tolerant anymore. Now think of there's some expressions about this line being crossed, which Sodom and Gomorrah had done. This is Psalm 78:59. When God heard this, he was wroth and greatly abhorred Israel, so that he forsook the tabernacle of Shiloh, the tent which he placed among them, that was the tabernacle, and delivered his strength, that's the Ark of the Covenant, into captivity, and his glory to the enemy's hand. He gave his people over also unto the sword, and was wroth with their inheritance. Now nobody could say that God had not been long-suffering. But they crossed the line. Psalm 106, 39. They were, they, thus they defiled, they were defiled with their own works and went a whoring after their own inventions. Therefore was the wrath of God kindled against the people insomuch that he abhorred his own inheritance and he gave them to the hand of the heathen and they that hated them ruled over them. I won't read the other text here, but there's, they crossed the borderline. Now there are attitudes and transgressions that will summon the wrath of God specific sins and levels of sin and sometimes I wonder if some of them haven't been committed in our country now the sin of Sodom is subject to a lot of disagreement this is where the term Sodomite comes from their sin was illicit relations of men with men and women with women. But if you hear people who defend this, they will say, no, 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 the sin of Sodom was not, that's not what they were punished for. And they will cite Ezekiel 16, 49 and 50. And I want to deal with this. As I live, saith the Lord God, Sodom my sister hath, hath not done, she, she nor her daughters, as thou hast done, thou and thy daughters. Behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom, pride, fullness of bread, Abundance of idleness was in her and in her daughters, neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy, and they were haughty and committed abomination before me, therefore I took them away as I saw good. So they say, see, there you are, see? The reason he did this was because they were prideful, they had fullness of bread, they were satisfied they had too much, they had abundance of idleness. She didn't strengthen the hand of the poor, she was haughty. See, that's why he did it. All right, here's what they overlooked. They overlooked the last sentence and committed abomination. So here in this, I tried to picture this in this chart. Pride was at the top. Then it got worse. Fullness of bread, they treated it as though it was their own. Abundance of idleness. Boy, it's like you're reading about our country here. Abundance of idleness, didn't strengthen the poor, and then all of that led to abomination, which is sodomy. Yeah. So sodomy is when they bottomed out. Yeah, that's right. he, didn't, he didn't judge them because they were idle. Uh -huh. He judged them for this abomination. Yeah. Uh -huh. <coughs> those, sins were, they, those sins were in a downward motion. Now we'll go down now, and I will see if this is altogether so, and if, they, if it... Uh, if it's not, I'll know. That is to say, if there's a reason to show mercy to these people, I will do it. Yes, if showing mercy to these people could be justified, uh -huh. if I could remain righteous and show mercy to these people, I will do it. Uh -huh. God's being presented as someone who doesn't just act on the spur of the moment. Uh -huh. If God brings the hammer down, it's because he's put up with too much. Yeah. 
It's got to be seen now. Yes, amen. <laughs> As I live, God said, I have no death. I have no delight in the death of the wicked. I'll do anything that's right to defer judgment. <laughs> he makes an appeal for the consideration. Abraham makes an appeal for the. He doesn't say, oh, "Look, Lord, Lord." They they don't know very much there. He makes an appeal for righteous. Is there somebody righteous there? Why right? to think on the righteous people that are there? Abraham stood still before the Lord. Now whether this is, I don't know how Abraham knew what was going to happen. Because that's not spelled out. It may be while he lingered there this was divulged to him. But Abraham takes up the cause. And he asks the Lord if, he's going, if he will destroy the righteous with the wicked. Now this is the first example in the Bible of intercession. 2,000 years into human history. <laughs> What's amazing? First example of intercession, Abraham draws near to intercede. Now, that's a requirement that's not generally known. I've known all kind of prayer groups and prayer chains and all this kind of thing that prayed that they didn't pray from a close up posture. They didn't draw near. It was just too casual. That's why nothing happened. Think of the boldness now and confidence that's required to like come close to God. No wonder even those in Christ are told, having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter by the whole end of the whole, by the blood of Jesus. So it tells us that you can't stroll into the presence of God. Amen. You got to come with a cleanliness. Now, we're beholding the manner in which intercession is made. He's reasoning. See, God has said to, through Isaiah, years, centuries later, he'll say, to, come, let us reason together. So, yeah. But Abraham, he's doing it. Like, centuries before this that was said, he's actually doing it. Will thou destroy the righteous with the wicked? Now, he's actually got only one example to reason with. That's Noah. That's the only example he's got yeah. of, of a wicked, of a righteous that wasn't destroyed with the wicked. Uh -huh. that's, the only, that's a solitary example in all the history of the world that he has. Well, now, what if he was like a modern day Christian? He didn't know about that because that took place up centuries before him. How would he have known how to pray? See, the, we've got a situation on our hand that defies scriptural explanation. Yeah. There has never been a situation like this in the Bible where a people has been given so much and knew so little. The great falling away, that's what it is. But he did, well, I'll destroy the righteous with the wicked. Yeah. You mentioned earlier uh, people's view of, of sin all being equal without varying degrees. If that was the case, then if God were indifferent towards different uh, varying degrees of sin, then he would have also been indifferent towards different uh, varyings of righteousness. That's right. Mm -hmm. Very good. Because it's the same character that responds to sin in uh, mm -hmm. with wrath and judgment. It's the same character of God or nature of God that dictated his response and his interaction to Abraham. Very good. Very good. So there'd be no difference who interceded. Mm -hmm. That's right. Amen. Or and he, he then he could have revealed it to anybody. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's so right. These, these things yeah. in the, the beginning of the text yeah. that he <laughs> he uh, cites as qualifications mm -hmm. in Abraham. These are things. This is why I can reveal it to him. Yeah. If he was indifferent, yeah. then he could have revealed it to anybody. Well, obviously he couldn't just mm -hmm. reveal it to anybody. Amen. See, that's why, that's why more revelation is given today as a means have been, has been accomplished and proclaimed that make changes men yeah. so they can qualify for this, for information like this. Now, <clears throat> later, 
we'll find out that Israel was differed from Sodom and Gomorrah in this respect, not necessarily in, con in total conduct, but be because there's a remnant. Uh -huh. yeah. And they, re they reasoned. There wasn't a remnant. There was not a remnant of Sodom. Lot came out, but he was not of Sodom. Right. He lived there, but he uh -huh. was... He wasn't like a sodomite. <laughs> uh, here's the reason. Isaiah wrote about it, then Paul quoted it in Romans 9, 29. Isaiah 1, 9. Except the Lord of hosts had left unto us a very small remnant, we should have been as Sodom, and we should have been like Gomorrah. We'd have been annihilated. They left us a very small remnant. Why? Because of this promise made to Abraham. He will command his children. It so, it so happened at that time, his children were a very small remnant. But this manner of thinking wasn't known in Abraham's time. That's, that's what makes this text stand out so much. That this wasn't, well, you know it, but he didn't know it. He didn't know this about God, but he had like an intuition evidently about this. That this doesn't sound like it would be like God. Far be it from thee, far be it from thee. Other versions say, you, you couldn't possibly do such a thing as destroy the righteous with the wicked. So you know, people try and scare you about the great tribulation, things like this. Got to think of this text here. Yeah. Wilt thou destroy the righteous with the wicked? Mm -hmm. See, you, God, you think about this. See, maybe you're concerned for your children. You think about this text here. Then work on being righteous. Far be it from thee. Do not think of doing such a thing. That wouldn't be right. And these are these are amazing uh, points of reasoning. Yeah. This wouldn't be right to do that. So you say, well, God can do what he wants. He wants to destroy the rights of the wicked. But well, this is not what you do. This is not what God would do. Mm -hmm. He'd make a way for the righteous, see, because he distinguishes mm -hmm. between people. Really yes. We've actually been going through this very point. There's a promise concerning the plagues because he severed the land of Goshen yeah. when he was punishing <laughs> Egypt. That's Even right. Even when ones where <coughs> human lives were at risk, he never allowed those things to affect his people. Amen. 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 This is a great consolation for the people. Now in our time, when the revelation of God has been honed to a fine edge in Christ, God has revealed more of himself in Christ than... You know, it's not to compare with previous times. So the failure to see this is proof that the church has heard about another God. Yeah, that's right. This is the real God we're talking about here. So people think they know God, they talk about God, all they know about a God, not the God. Abraham knew the God with a very sparse amount of revelation. So to not know God with an abundance of revelation, this will not be looked at kindly from heaven. Amen. Established earlier on, it doesn't take a lot. You don't have That's to right. know a lot about God to That's be right. like Abraham. So, you know, that just uh, that extenuates the abundance we have today. I just uh, we're filling up the cup of wrath. That's you right. say. Yeah. God is allowing this. See, God's in the end. God's going to show that when you neglect this great salvation, there is no way that you can come into an understanding of God or be saved. It just can't happen. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, a pleasure of the Lord. Yes here of Abraham, I've always been blessed by the confidence that he has yeah. shown in, in reasoning with the Lord. Yeah. And I was considering that that confidence is based in the knowledge that he has of the Lord and his working. Yeah. That's right. And I never, I don't think I'd ever seen with the working of the past because without that knowledge, he would be limited That's right. in the knowledge of God himself because That's right. God mm -hmm. has made known through his works. Amen. Now how, would, how will it appear on the day of judgment here will be who knows how many people that lived prior to, prior to the scriptures that didn't have any scriptures and yet they, they knew more than the people of this, these other generations come up that had all this abundance of revelation. How do you suppose this is going to come across on the day of judgment? 
He to whom much is given, much is required. So the church today should excel Abraham, but instead is struggling to come up to his level. Yeah, right. yeah. The foundational level, you, you hit on it. It's because they're, they're hearing about another God. Another God, that's And right. so that God doesn't transform them or enable them. That's right. In fact, boldness or confidence to them is, a, is, is casualness. That's right. Remember Jesus said one time, Accept your righteousness, exceed that of the Pharisees, scribes and Pharisees. Ye shall in no case enter the kingdom of heaven. Now the scribes and Pharisees were spotless outwardly. That's right. Mm -hmm. To a person who isn't spotless outwardly, they're worse than the scribes and Pharisees. At least they can clean up the outside. If a person can't clean up the outside, what in the world is wrong? Is there something deficient in salvation? No. Well, you didn't need Christ to clean up the outside. You need him to clean up the inside. Yeah. Now, he, he pleads with God, so I've taken upon myself. After God said, if I find 50, I'll spare a city for 50. Well, actually, there were five cities that were slated for destruction. One of them was spared for Lot's sake. So, when he just mentioned Sodom, Evidently, it was like a pioneer. It was like the Las Vegas of the day. But it had infected the area around about him. So he reasons, he goes from 50 to 45. And then from uh, 45 to 40. And he drops down to 30. Things are getting kind of hard. And he goes down to 20. And finally to 10. <laughs> Notice the progression. <laughs> Gets fewer numbers. He goes. I guess the gap is is wider between the two. And he gets down to ten. Now Jude addresses this matter that there's there's a kind of a danger associated with dealing with sinners. It's kind of a danger about being too long around them, and it's it's kind of a danger associated with it. I got to approach this with great caution, but I'll do my best to do so. Jude said, "Of some make a, have compassion, making a difference. Others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garments spotted by the flesh. Those on whom you have compassion, those are like earnest seekers. They're the people who say, what's, better, brother, what should we do? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. What was I going to be saved? Here, here's water. What does me to be baptized? See, that's you can make a difference. You could speak differently to people like that. Uh -huh. that's right. And on others." Make a difference now, while others get to pull them out of the fire, hating even the garments brought by the flesh. The fear is not, it's not fear in them. It's not scare them. Preach out fire and damnation to them. That, that's not what he's saying. He's saying, you, if people aren't turned by the gospel, tread softly. Hate even the garments spotted by the flesh. We live in a day when there are garments yeah. spotted by the flesh. Yeah. you got to hate it. Yeah. If you're talking to a person, well, I'll just tell you what I did, mm -hmm. my own. We come across a group of people who said they were interested in the Lord. And they, were, they dressed scantily. Mm -hmm. So I told them, put some clothes on. Mm -hmm. If you don't have any, I'll get you some clothes. But you got to put some clothes on before I talk. I hate the garments brought about the fuss. They didn't know anything about it. But see, I did know something yeah, about it. Uh -huh. yeah, yeah. I knew how God felt about nakedness. I knew how he felt about it. So I told that's the first issue God had for mankind's clothing. They had to have adequate clothing on before he went any further. There had to be adequate clothing. Yeah. See, there's a, there's a contaminating influence. Oh, I've seen it happen. Maybe I myself have been affected sometime in the past when I was a little obtuse. Being around people, they were low-life sinners, bad. And I was just—I wasn't cautious enough. Save them with fear. God, with you—you you have the fear. 
lest you be contaminated. But don't be deceived, Paul says. Don't be deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. You spend your time around a lot of low-life sinners, it'll corrupt your manners. You'll, you'll start living differently to accommodate to those people. Now, we can't pass laws on how to do this. You've got to be alert to this. Take this seriously. Abraham didn't just continue, continue, pleading, continue, pleading. He just stopped at 10, that was it. See, we learned from this, too, that, um, well, you remember that uh, Lot, he couldn't come up with 10. Mm -hmm. Lot, his daughters were married, remember, and he told his sons-in-law, he said, judgment's coming. Yeah. And the scripture says he seemed like he mocked. He's like a crazy man. Yeah. Didn't pay any attention to him. Mm -hmm. So Lot, see, Lot engaged in an effort trying to try and, try and get 10, you might say, but he... He couldn't, he couldn't rally, he couldn't even get his own sons-in-law in. How about that? So him and his wife and daughters left, goodbye. That's the, one of the first homes split, you know, over the truth. Yeah. Now you learn from this that some judgment can't be averted. There's some judgment that can't be averted. Cain's couldn't be averted. Nobody could step in and change what was said to Cain. Nobody could step in and plead for the world of Noah's day. It was, couldn't be changed. Sodom and Gomorrah, Adma, Zeboam, they, they couldn't be changed. Whole generations of Israelites couldn't be changed. God said, that's it. Now you're not entering in. When he said that, that was it. It couldn't be changed. No inter While they're wandering around the wilderness, they didn't have like 15 converts from the original 600,000. Oh, it, it was, couldn't be changed. I'm showing you there's a, there's sin leads ultimately leads to this. So at some point a person's got to get out from the dominion of sin. They've got to get out and reign over their bodies. They've got to do it because if they don't, it'll come to this point where they're irretrievable. Amen. There was Belshazzar. When he, when he took, asked for the golden vessels that were dedicated to God to be brought out, he drank wine out of them, he crossed the line, that was it. Said, your kingdom's taken from you, and that night he died in Persia, and Babylon fell. And in Jerusalem, he said, I would have gathered you, how often would I have gathered you together? As a hen doth her chicks, and you would not. Now your house is less deathless, desolate. There was no way to avert that judgment. No intercession could change it. <coughs> uh, here's, I wanted to read this. It's a, a little lengthy, but it, it, it explains this quite well. God's intolerance with Israel. This is found in Numbers 14, 22 through 35. It's after they had rejected the report of the Joshua and Caleb about the promised land. Because all those men which have seen my glory and my miracles, which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness, see, so they <laughs> have tempted, and they have tempted me now these ten times, and have not hearkened to my voice. Surely they shall not see the land which I swear unto their fathers, neither shall any of them that provoked me see it, but my servant Caleb, because he had another spirit with him, and hath followed me fully. Him will I bring into the land wherein he went, and his seed shall possess it. Now the Amalekites and Canaanites dwelt in the valley. Tomorrow turn you, get you into the wilderness by the way of the Red Sea. <laughs> Back to the wilderness. Can't go in. And the Lord spake unto Moses unto Aaron, saying, How long shall I bear with this evil congregation which murmur against me? I have heard the murmurings of the children of Israel, which they murmured against me, saying to them, As truly as, as I live, saith the Lord, as I have spoken in mine e as ye have spoken in mine ears, so will I do to you. Your carcasses shall fall in the wilderness, and all that were numbered of you, according to your whole number, from twenty years old and upward, which have murmured against me, doubtless ye shall not come into the land. And I won't read the rest, but see that <coughs> God can be driven to that point. That's my point. <coughs> The righteousness of God will be vindicated this entire account. God will leave you with the impression you don't dare come into my presence in an unrighteous state. I have made provision for your cleansing. You take advantage of it. If you don't, well, we don't want to think about that. The 
righteousness of God will be vindicated. And then the Lord went on his way after he had communed. See, same thing before. When, he, when, the, when the Lord's business was over, the conversation was over. <laughs> As in all contacts from heaven, the visitation centered in the will and purpose of God. Now that should help us to to always tune our hearts to the divine agenda. <coughs> now the advantage for those in Christ God has shown through history that whenever he looks at iniquity judgment is around the corner. Now the dilemma God doesn't have a dilemma, but it looks like a dilemma. The dilemma God has is, how can he be righteous and deal with sinners? Now here's where Jesus comes in. The only way he can do this is through Christ. Who took away the sin and cleanses you from all unrighteousness. That's the only way he can do this. He can't do it any other way. There's no way to get out from under the judgment of God other than through Christ, you've got to be like in Christ, and Christ has to be in you. Yeah, and you've been called into fellowship with Christ. You have to walk in that fellowship and walk in the light. That, that's the only way God can deal with you. Yeah. This is a this is a tremendous truth to see. Amen. This is why the believer in Christ has been given so much to compensate for to offset this fact because God's righteous and God will not compromise His righteousness. Amen. If it's not righteous to save you, if it's not the right thing to save you, you won't be saved. That's right. It's really that simple. Jesus makes it right to save you. Not by taking away the sin only, but by recreating you in God's image so you become workable and teachable. <clears throat> now in Christ you have fellowship with Christ. See, Abraham didn't have that. Christ dwells in your heart by faith. Abraham didn't have that. Holy Spirit sent into your heart. Abraham didn't have that. You have fellowship with the Father and with the Son. Abraham didn't have that. You have eternal life. Abraham didn't have that. You have the intercession of Christ and the intercession of the Holy Spirit. The leading of the Holy Spirit. Grace teaching you. Continual access to God. All spiritual blessings. All things being alive in godliness. Your eyes of your understanding open. Partakers of Christ. Partakers of the divine nature. And a host of other things. You've got all that. Abraham had none of it. So the prospect is very, very bright <laughs> for those in Christ. Then it says, uh, Abraham returned to his place. Don't think he didn't do a lot of that great thinking. Mm -hmm. One time when Moses got to dealt with Israel, and they went to their tents and said they had great cogitations. They had great cogitations when they went back to their tents. Well, you can imagine the kind of thoughts Abraham had. Because God didn't tell Abraham, I'm going, don't worry, I'm going to deliver a lot. He, he, did. <laughs> he didn't tell Abraham that. Now, while, while Abraham was increasing, mm -hmm. at the same time, Sodom and Gomorrah were decreasing mm -hmm. at the same time. A blessing is promised to Abraham, and at the same time, cursing pronounced against Sodom and Gomorrah. Mm -hmm. Now, this is a picture of the end of the world. Mm -hmm. Things that are going to happen simultaneously. Yeah. Here's how Paul put it. To you who are troubled, rest with us when the, when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and the glory of his power, when, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and admired in all in the believers. So at the same time, he's being glorified in them that believe. He's cursing the ungodly. This is happening at the same time. You are a lot of theology. They don't, they don't believe this. He was two separate judgments, two separate comings. Just, oh, this isn't the case. Here's the words of Jesus. He speaks on this. The hour is coming and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God and they that hear shall live. For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself. 
and has given him authority to execute judgment because he's the son of man. Now that's speaking about hearing and awakening from sin. Some people, at the same, the same message, same time. Some people awake, some people are dead. Uh -huh. Amen. At the same time. Yeah. Same presentation. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming, in which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice and shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life, they that have done evil to the resurrection of damnation. Amen. Same time. Amen. Same resurrection. Yeah. Same event. Yeah. Same day. Mm -hmm. Some are raised to life, yeah. some are raised to yeah. damnation. Right. <laughs> what a picture. It's depicted right here. Abraham's growing, growing. Sodom's going down, going down, going down. But what if, what if Abraham had been going down too? This is how, this is how the modern church, this is how it's chosen. This is the path it's chosen. It's chosen the downward, compromising, conceding course. So the world's going down, it's going down. This contradicts everything God has done with men. It contradicts it. If this is valid, God has different than he was before. Before he's always recognized the righteous while he's judging the unrighteous. Now, some have great difficulty with that, but that's the way it, uh, that's the way it is. I had, I had hoped to develop a little further this role of Christ. Now that Christ made it right for God to save people. And this view of God, that God just, he's so pitiful and everything. This, he is pitiful, merciful. But this, is, this hasn't presented a proper view of God. God's character cannot change. He cannot not be repulsed by sin. This is impossible. And he cannot not be drawn to a humble and contrite spirit. Even if it's a Gentile who doesn't know Christ, like Cornelius. Even if it's him. Even if it's a group of women that don't know Christ praying by a riverside in Macedonia. He can't. He can't turn away from that. When someone seeks the Lord, has a humble, contrite spirit, calls on the name of the Lord, God can't ignore that. And when someone fails to do it, God can't ignore that either. Yes, now, if it weren't for Christ, see, this would be an impossible right. situation. Earlier, but it, if this had not been prepared before the world had been That's made, right. then it wouldn't have gotten no further than Adam and Eve. That's right. Because it, it, God is so just or he is just in that at the moment that they transgressed it would have been dealt with so summarily dealt with and it would have been right. over and yet because there was a lamb slain before the foundation of the world now God can be just in in initiating this this plan this this That's thing right. that God, his eternal purpose <coughs> now in, in, the, in the believer you know God started working in in the in the believer a long time before he believed oh, yes. but he was justified in doing it because he was going to believe. That's right. Because God was going to give him grace to believe. But see, he didn't do that right off the bat. The Holy Spirit brings you. It, it, it like draws you yeah. to, to where when you hear the gospel, you can respond in faith. But that faith had to be given. Yeah. Well, how did all that work? Because Christ died. Yeah, because of Christ. It's because it's of Christ. Be the, uh, on behalf, yeah, on behalf of Christ. Of Christ. Yeah. So, right. so it, only God could do it like this because he's outside right. of time. Here, before Christ dies, he's merciful to the people. After Christ dies, 2,000 years later, you are sensitive of God and God can give you repentance because 2,000 years That's ago right. Christ died. He honors, he honors what Jesus did. Amen. He right. does what Cornelius did, God honored, but it was not sufficient to justify him. And I think I had a little chart in there about that, that God has always received people that were righteous and Godly and tried to live to please God, but when it comes to justification, that now that just had to do with approval to live in the world. Uh -huh. yeah. When it comes to justification, that's a higher level. Yeah. That requires faith in Christ. Amen. That's right. So someone has to be sent to Cornelius. Yes. 
to tell him about this, or he'll just stay a Gentile, unregenerate Gentile. But you see, the, the glory of it is that God has provided, his wisdom has provided a redemption that cannot be gainsaid or criticized. He's absolutely righteous in the execution of salvation down to the finest detail. Amen. He's justified in forsaking Jesus, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and he's justified in receiving you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> good? <laughs> mm -hmm. Anyone else there? Brother Rick? Out of that text, behold both the severity yeah. and the goodness of God. <laughs> Abraham's intercession is an excellent example of what fearing God is. Amen. Yeah. See, he, he knew God was good, but he was unwilling to press God yeah. and, and, and be somehow inappropriate mm -hmm. in his intercession. And, uh, you know, I was thinking of uh, the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. You may recall at the end of that, after everything is set right, Aslan is leaving to go back to his place. And Lucy had, throughout the, uh, the book, has this special tenderness and drawing toward Aslan. And so she's disappointed to see him go. Remember, she's having this conversation with Mr. Tumnus. And Mr. Tumnus says, but you must not press him because he's not a tame lion. And then Lucy says, but he is good. <laughs> and so that's a, that's a marvelous yeah. picture of what yeah, the man. fear of God is. We, we are convinced of his goodness, but that does not mean we act in an unrighteous that's manner right. and press him. Amen. I've always admired this, this way Abraham interceded for the yeah. cities. Now, uh, Abraham was sharp as a tack. Oh, I mean, yes. He was really, he was really smart. <laughs> yeah. He was, and uh, but he was, and his faith that made him like that. Yes, See, right. he could, he could right. reason with the Lord, and and uh, and and he'd done a really, real good at it. He was the way he approached God, and 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 but he made his point with him. I was, I've always was impressed with that. Uh, I was considering that you brought up uh, how God does so many things at one time. Two, it, 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 his, uh, his word is a testimony to those who are being yeah. saved and also those, to those who are being condemned at That's the same right. time. So That's he, right. he brings us out. And, this is, and you can counter, you can calculate God this way. See, he is, uh, he is consistent. He, he works this way in all the things he does. Mm -hmm. he's, he's doing this on this one hand and he's doing it at the same time he's doing this. Mm -hmm. That's the way it's going to be at the end of time, just like yeah. you pointed out. Uh -huh. Amen. Yes, Judah? Brother Paul, the Paul wrote to, I don't, I don't remember who it was. I can't, I don't remember who it was. Either. It was either the Corinthians or the Hebrews. Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together, as the manner of some is. And when you read there at the beginning, the, the place where it says Abraham went out with the three men, that's, that's what he was doing. He wasn't forsaking the assembling mm -hmm. of him and the appearing of God. He, was, he wasn't taking that for granted. That, that is a thing that should be admired. Yes, amen. amen. Mm -hmm. All right. Our Heavenly Father, we're grateful for the revelation of yourself that you've given in these accounts. And we praise thee for being righteous in all your ways. We are seeking grace, Father, to be acceptable in your sight at any price. In the name of Jesus, amen.